Dear comrades, friends, comrades, friends and, colleagues, and colleagues, I'm very honored and touched um, to have the chance to open the conference Rosa Luxemburg at 150, revisiting her life and legacy together with Otto Kaluban, the chairperson of the International Rosa Luxemburg Society. What would Rosa Luxemburg have thought? This is a question which was coming into my mind in, in, in the last days and months when we were preparing the many events we are doing around her 150th birthday. When she would have known that people from all over the world will come together to celebrate her, think about her, and seeing her work again. I guess she would have been happy and honored and touched as well. She probably would not have liked it to have so much attention paid by her. But we don't know. The truth, the fact is we are here. When the pandemic um, showed us last summer that we probably will not be able to have a usual conference where the researchers will all come together. And we tried to see it as a chance and it worked out. Due to the work of many people who focused very practically and I guess nearly everybody who we invited um, to, uh, to join said yes. Um, it worked out that we all came together from many continents in the world um, to do this conference together. We were overwhelmed um, when we recognized yesterday that more than 11,000 people showed their interest on Facebook and more than 1,000 people um, said that they want to see the conference and discuss with us. Um, my special thanks goes to Otto Karl Luban, who opened his arms um, immediately when we came up with the idea to uh, cooperate in the conference and who brought together almost all the researchers in the world who work on Rosa Luxemburg. Without Lauren Ballhorn and Wiebke Boyshausen, um, who did all the organizational tasks, and we see we are still learning, so sorry for the, for the little delay, um, the conference would never uh, would have been possible. Some researchers are missing here in the program because we are doing a double program also in Germany. So my colleagues Jörn Schüttrum, Volker Pollitt, Uwe Sonnenberg and many others who wrote important books and did translations are taking part in, in the same time in the German conference which we are doing here in Berlin and which will be, avail will be available online as well. So you could see it um, later. We never ourselves did such a big conference online. So we have to learn from Rosa Luxemburg again that lifelong learning will never end. She would have taken it as a method of becoming free and emancipation and, and going for emancipation. We are looking forward to have a very diverse and, uh, and long program for the next two days. After the little opening, and I'm going to hand over to Ottokar um, after presenting the program, and we will have, and we are very much honored, a keynote by Michael Levy, and uh, then a little break, and uh, afterwards a panel um, about the reception of Rosa Luxemburg on the Asian continent. The, a big task by doing the program was already bringing all the people together in the times where they could be wake up to join us here. So the Asians uh, come first and that they could join. At uh, three o'clock Berlin time, uh, we're going to have a panel about the enduring question, feminism and Rosa Luxemburg. And we are really honored that Frigga Hauck um, uh, also will also join us for this panel. At um, five o'clock, we're gonna speak about Rosa Luxemburg in Latin America. And at seven Berlin time, we're gonna have a book lounge we are very much looking forward to about realizing Rosa Luxemburg. Tomorrow, the real birthday of Rosa Luxemburg um, will start with the panel um, on uh, the, the challenges of political strategy 
which um, I was very happy that Lea Epi, Michael Bri, and Joshua Barwand um, are open to take place in. Then we, have, we were able to bring together some of the most important interpreters and artists um, who worked on Rosa Luxemburg in the last uh, years. Um, Rosa Luxemburg and the written word. Among them is our dear friend Kate Evans, who wrote the marvelous graphic novel about Rosa Luxemburg um, and also Helen Scott and Dana Mills. Um, the last panel for tomorrow will be um, uh, about the accumulation of capital, the mass strike, and the crisis of neoliberal capitalism. The closing keynote presentation will be held by Peter Judis. Um, the and both keynotes will be recorded, so you could see them also afterwards. Now I hand over to you, Ottokar, and I'm thanking a lot for, again for having the honor to chair um, the conference with you. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, welcome uh, to all the participants in the Rosa Luxemburg Internet. On behalf of our International Rosa Luxemburg Society, I send a cordial welcome to all participants. Uh, the International Rosa Luxemburg Society, in, in German, Internationale Rosa Luxemburg Gesellschaft, is a network of Rosa Luxemburg scholars, which was founded in 1980 by Professor Nariiko Ito, a Japanese historian from Tokyo. Together with uh, Rosa Luxemburg researchers in Europe, uh, he was organizing uh, an exchange uh, of uh, research results uh, with, uh, uh, in the frame of conferences, especially uh, uh, having contacts uh, with researchers from uh, East Germany. Uh, the venues were in Chicago, in Paris, in Zurich, Warsaw, Moscow, Peking, in Canton, uh, Seoul, in Tokyo, Hamburg, Berlin, uh, and in some other cities. Uh, when I uh, uh, came to Seoul in 2015 for a conference, I was very astonished uh, that a uh, Korean scholar me, uh, uh, handed over to me uh, a book with a translation of Rosa Luxemburg's economic works, uh, the introduction into national economy and uh, the accumulation of capital. Uh, we had a lot of uh, publications uh, in the last 10 years, uh, often in connection with scholars which visited our uh, conferences and were in contact uh, with us. Uh, I have half a meter of books from uh, China, uh, J Japan, uh, India uh, on Rosa Luxemburg. And of course, there are many books uh, in uh, Latin America, uh, recently by Isabel Loreiro and uh, Pablo Slavin. And the biggest projects are uh, the complete works uh, of Rosa Luxemburg with the chief editor Peter Judis uh, in France. The collective uh, Smolny is uh, doing the same work with a French edition. And most ambitious in Wuhan, uh, the Chinese scholars. Uh, have started uh, the project of uh, the complete works uh, in Chinese. Uh, due to an initiative uh, by Evelyn Wittig, uh, who was in uh, 2004, 
uh, who was then the head of the foundation, uh, they developed a very fertile cooperation between our society and the foundation as is shown again with this conference. Uh, this gives me the opportunity to thank all those uh, colleagues here at the foundation for their uh, wonderful work for uh, the festival at, uh, uh, as they uh, named it uh, for the 150th uh, birthday of Rosa Luxemburg. In uh, 2013, we had an impressive uh, Rosa Luxemburg conference at the Sorbonne in Paris, organized by a French committee headed by Michael Levy. Uh, and he succeeded not only to attract a big audience uh, of over 200, but to have also Pre produce a video of the whole conference, uh, which is, is still online and you can see it there. And also we had a conf uh, special conference issue of the journal Argone with contributions uh, of uh, the uh, researchers which presented their papers at the conference. Michael Löwy uh, is a, was a director was a, a director of the famous French research institution CNRS, now Emeritus, uh, and he presented at uh, several of our conferences his uh, papers on Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, interesting was for me that even uh, the Greeks uh, um, uh, asked for a special paper uh, of him uh, some years ago on Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, he has had a recent publication in French and uh, Rosa uh, and in Germany, where he uh, summarized his uh, considerations on Rosa Luxemburg, and I hope there will be uh, an English uh, issue very soon too. Uh, now I have this the pleasure and the honor to give the floor the internet floor to Michael Löwy. Uh, Otto Kahn, my friend. Let me start just by saying something personal. Uh, I fell in love with Rosa Luxemburg at the age 15 in Brazil, where I was born. And uh, since then, uh, she's still very, very deeply in my heart, yes? So uh, this uh, is somehow a kind of guiding star for me throughout my, my life. Well, I'm going to say a few words now on Rosa Luxemburg's internationalism under the perspective of what she called either or. Either you choose imperialism and national defense or you choose proletarian unity and internationalism. Yeah? Well, there, there are a few figures in the social socialist movement that were so committed to the international ideal as Rosa Luxemburg. As you know, she was Polish, she was Jewish, she was German, but she didn't belong to any nationality. Yeah? Her only fatherland or better motherland 
was the Socialist International. Yes. Now, it's true yes. that her radical internationalism uh, sometimes led her to take some questionable positions on the national question by rejecting the um, right of national self-determination, etc. Uh, many, most of the writings on her <clears throat> reflection on these issues concentrate on these questionable issues. This applies also to some of my own writings. But I think it's time now for us to see the positive side of her views, by which I mean her internationalism, her contribution to the Marxist internationalist view, and her uh, stubborn rejection of the nationalist ideology, chauvinism, etc. Well, Georg Lukacs, in his well-known Geschichte und Klassenbewusstsein, History and Class Consciousness, 1923, argued that the dialectical category of totality is, I quote, the true carrier of the revolutionary principle in science. And he saw Rosa Luxemburg's writings as perhaps the most striking example of this dialectical approach. This phrase appears in a chapter of the book called Rosa Luxemburg as a Marxist. Now, I think Rosa Luxemburg's internationalism is a very good example of this dialectical category of totality. Because from the internationalist perspective, he envisioned, she considered all social and political issues of her time, she analyzed them, discussed and judged them according to this viewpoint of totality, I, in other terms, from the viewpoint of the interest of the international working class movement. Now, for her, this dialectical totality was not an abstraction, uh, an empty universalism. Yes. She knew well that the international proletariat is a human plurality, yes, composed of people with their own culture, their own language, and their own history. Yes. But she believed that in spite of these differences, unity was possible. Proletarian from other lenders, for any proletarians of all countries unite, was for her the motto and she held to this against all uh, chauvinist uh, views because she believed the workers could unite internationally against their common enemy, imperialism, war, and the capitalist system in less analysis. Yeah? So this is, uh, let's say, what characterized uh, the dialectical uh, uh, content, yes, of her uh, internationalism. Now, unlike most of the socialists of her time, her internationalism was not limited to the European countries. Yeah? Very early on, before most other socialist leaders, she was an active opponent of the colonial wars of the European imperial states. And she did not heed her sympathy for the struggles of the colonial peoples. These include, of course, German colonial wars in Africa, as the brutal repression of the Herero uprising in Southwest Africa in 904. Let me quote from a speech she did in June 1911 about this event. I quote, 
the Herreros are a Negro people, which has lived for centuries in his homeland. Their crime was that they did not give in to white slave drivers and defended their land against foreign invaders, German colonial troops. This war by German witch weapons was not at all glorious. The men were shot, the women and children pushed into the burning desert. End of the quote. So one clearly sees she's taking side with the Herero people against German colonials. She has another piece of her, which is quite well known from 902, called Martinique. And here she denounced the crimes of Western colonialism in general. In the Antilles, in Martinique, for instance, in Madagascar, in the Philippines, and above all in China, where she says, France, England, Russia, and Germany, the big colonial powers, united in a great League of Nations to murder and plunder the country, China. But she doesn't forget also United States imperialism. She mentions how the sugarcane Senate in the United States sent, I quote, cannon upon cannon, worship upon worship, golden dollars, millions upon millions to Cuba to sow death and devastation. End of the quote. It is from this paper, it's called Martinique from 902. Yeah? So one could give other examples, but I think <clears throat> she has an idea, idea which I think is very relevant today in the accumulation of capital, 1913. She explains that the accumulation of capital is not only a period, historical period from the 16th, 17th century. No, it's a permanent process of violent expropriation yeah? until today. Let me quote from the accumulation of capital. She says, the accumulation of capital employs force as a permanent weapon, not only in its genesis, its origin, but further down to the present day. Now, from the point of view of the primitive societies involved, the victims of the colonial invasions, it is a matter of life or death. For them, there can be no other attitude than opposition and fight to the finish. Hence, permanent occupation of the colonies by the military, native risings and punitive expeditions are the order of the day for any colonial regime. End of the quote, accumulation of capital. Now, there were very few socialists at that time that not only denounced colonial expeditions and colonial regimes, but justified the colonialized people, resistance and fight. Yeah? So this attitude reveals the truly universal character of her internationalism, even if, of course, Europe was the center of the attention for her. So I think this is something which is not usually taken into account. Yeah? Her uh, total uh, radical opposition to colonialism and her solidarity with the resistance of the colonized people. Yeah? I think this is something very important to understand the meaning of her internationalism. 
Now, August 1914, as you know, was a tragic moment in the history of the labor, the National Socialist Labor Movement, when most leaders of the socialist parties uh, took the side of national defense, yeah? supported their governments in the war, the government of the Kaiser in Germany, of the Tsar in Russia, of the uh, various uh, civil governments in France, etc., etc. Um, sacred unity in defense of the fatherland, etc. Of course, also in Germany. And as we know, she, since the beginning, yeah, opposed, radically opposed this chauvinist, this aggressive, patriotic ideology. Yeah? And denounced the treason of the SPD leaders to the principles of proletarian internationalism. Now, uh, Peter Nettle, well-known author of a biography of Rosa Luxemburg, which has many qualities, but some limitations, because he was not a Marxist <laughs> revolutionary, but a, an academic figure. Now, trying to explain Rosa Luxemburg's radical opposition to this capitulation of the social democratic leader to German war politics, he says, Peter Nettle, there was in their growing hatred of SPD policies, SPD, Social Democratic Partei Deutschland, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, there was a strong personal element. The eternal, ill-suppressed impatience and frustration of emigres like Rosa Luxemburg, with the ponderous and official Germans. End of the quote by Peter Nettle. I'm afraid this explanation is not very useful. Yeah? In fact, opposition to the war, to the imperialist German war, was not limited to emigres, to foreign people yeah, in the socialist movement, but there were normal German figures who also opposed the war, like Karl Liebknecht, of course, Clara Zetkin, Franz Mering, etc., and many others. Huh? So the motivation for Rosa Luxemburg's uh, opposition to the social patriotic capitulation of August 1914 was not emigre impatient. It was her lifelong commitment to internationalism. Now, as you know, because of her opposition to the war, she was jailed several times. She spent most of the war years in jail. And she, uh, still in jail, she would continue to write and to think. And in 1916, she wrote and a clandestine pamphlet, which was published by the Spartacus Group. And the title of this pamphlet is Entweder oder, either or. And I think this pamphlet wonderfully summarizes her views on these issues. Yeah? She says, for instance, the, fa the fatherland of the proletariat, the defense of which must take precedence over all else, is the socialist international. And she continues. The time for half measures and hesitations is over. It is either or, entweder oder. Either open and shameless betrayal of the international or taking the international in sacred seriousness so that it becomes a bastion of the world socialist proletariat and of the world peace. This pamphlet, either or, contains a very moving personal statement of her most cherished moral and political values. Let me quote again from this pamphlet, either or. The international fraternity of the workers 
is for me the highest and the most sacred thing on earth. It is my guiding star, my idea, my fatherland. I prefer to give up my life than to become unfaithful to this idea. End of the quote. And as we know, she paid for with her life for her commitment. Now, uh, also in this pamphlet, either or, she insisted that new wars would happen as long as imperialism and capitalism continue to exist. She said, I quote again, world peace cannot be secured by such utopian plans as international courts of habitation composed of capitalist diplomats. European federations, custom unions, national buffer states, and the like. Imperialism, militarism, and wars will not be abolished as long as the rule of the capitalist classes continues. End of the quote, either or, 1916. And one last quote from this pamphlet, which I think really summarize her deepest feelings and thought. The immediate task of socialism in Germany and Europe shall be the intellectual liberation of the proletariat from the domination of the bourgeoisie as manifest in the influence of the nationalistic ideology. Yeah. I think her warnings were prophetic because as we know, uh, the diplomatic uh, conversation, the League of Nations, uh, all this did not prevent another war, another imperialist war, the Second World War, uh, and many other wars, the other colonial wars, imperialist wars, etc. So the history of the 20th century is the history of colonial and imperialist war. Uh, and this led so, to some, as we know, of the worst crimes in human history, which the names of Auschwitz and Hiroshima are summarized. Yeah. So her, her, her warning was prophetic. Prophetic, not in the mean only of seeing what was going to happen, but in the sense of the prophets of the Old Testament, uh, which would say, look what will happen if we don't react, if we don't uh, move yeah, and to try to change things. Well, so uh, this is uh, why, of course, she could not predict, for instance, a genocide. Uh, she, she, she was very uh, warning about the dangers of nationalist, chauvinist, uh, racist yeah, ideology, but she couldn't have predicted how far this would go, taking the form of genocide. Yeah. Now, what is, let me conclude with the question, what is the relevance of Rosa Luxemburg's uh, internationalism today, 21st century, 2021? Yeah? Now, uh, we have to recognize that internationalism is more than ever a decisive issue. First, because capitalist globalization has imposed its power on a world scale to a degree unprecedented in human history, yeah? promoting obscene degrees of inequality and leading to catastrophic consequences on the ecological level, yeah? climate change, for instance. Through its institutions, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, World Trade Organization, etc., it has achieved a united block of the capitalist ruling classes around the principles of neoliberalism, deregulation, etc., etc. Unfortunately, the proletariat, the subaltern classes are lagging 
behind. They are very much fragmented, dispersed, and without efficient forms of international organization, sadly. But there are signs of hope, such as the International Movement for Global Justice, which takes different forms, which is sowing the seeds of a new internationalist culture. The convergence of socialists, communists, anarchists, trade unions, feminists, ecologists, workers' movements, peasant movements, indigenous communities, etc., etc., against capitalist globalization is an important step forward. Rosa Luxemburg's heritage cannot give all the answers, of course, but it can suggest some important lessons for this movement. First, the enemy is not just globalization or neoliberalism, but the world capitalist system, as she always insisted. Yeah? Second, as long as the system prevails, there will be new wars, new imperialist interventions, new ethnic purges, etc., etc. We are seeing this today. Three, the alternative to global capitalist hegemony is not national sovereignty, uh, the defense of the national against the global, etc. It is to globalize which means internationalized resistance. Yeah, that's what we need. Yeah? And the capitalist system breeds nationalism, chauvinism, xenophobia, racism, which can take fascist forms. Yeah? And it is a mortal danger for democracy and for socialism, of course. And finally, the alternative to the empires is not a regulated form of capitalism, but a new, a socialist, a democratic world civilization. I think these are some of the lessons of Rosa Luxemburg which are relevant. Now, I would say that Rosa Luxemburg International is particularly relevant in our time for an issue which at her times was practically unknown which is the ecological crisis. Climate change, as we know, knows no national border. It's a global issue, of course, which can be dealt only on an international scale. This has been well understood by a very improbable heir to Rosa Luxemburg, the young Greta Thunberg, huh, who called for a successful global school strike, which mobilized millions of young people around the planet. I think climate change, the ecological crisis, is the greatest threat to life in human history. Uh, some bourgeois governments like Donald Trump, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, etc., deny climate change and in the name of national interest, energetically promote fossil fuels, etc., everything which is leading to catastrophic climate change. Other countries, Europe and Canada, etc., uh, pretend to take some measures to reduce their carbon emissions, but without any effective result, because they are all committed to capital accumulation and to the competitivity of the national capitalist economy. So I would conclude by paraphrasing a well-known passage by Walter Benjamin in his thesis on the concept of history, über den Begriff der Geschichte, By the way, Walter Benjamin was a great admirer of Rosa Luxemburg. I would say either we stop by pulling the revolutionary emergency brakes, the train of modern capitalist industrial civilization, or 
it will continue its suicidal course towards an abyss, ecological catastrophe, climate change. Here too, the time for half measures is over. It is entweda over, either or. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Michael, for that presentation. Um, my name is Lauren. Uh, I uh, am the editor of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung's English website, and will also be one of the moderators and chairs of the conference for the next two days. Um, thanks to Michael again for speaking, and also thanks to everyone who's watching us on Facebook. We had uh, some technical delays in the beginning, so uh, you may have missed the first uh, couple minutes. I want to thank again Johanna Bussemer. Uh, from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and Adhikar Luban from the International Rosa Luxemburg Society, who uh, are the co-hosts of uh, today and tomorrow's conference and um, who, who introduced uh, the beginning of the conference uh, earlier this morning. Uh, Michael, we have a couple of questions from uh, the audience that I'd like to ask you. Um, the first one is, uh, Someone is asking if you could explain what Rosa Luxemburg meant with the phrase primitive communist societies, uh, which you also mentioned in your presentation. Uh, Michael, are you? Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, okay, can you yeah. hear me? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, the idea of primitive communism didn't originate with Rosa Luxemburg. It appears, for instance, in Friedrich Engels' writings, particularly in the origin of family, private property, and the state. Yes? And uh, primitive communism was used by Engels to describe uh, societies uh, in prehistorical times, but not only, but which still existed, for instance, indigenous tribes in the United States and Canada, etc., which did not know uh, the patriarchal family, the private property, and the state. Yeah? So they lived in a kind of community of society, which he designated with this term, primitive communists. Yeah? Now, Rosa Luxemburg was very much interested in this issue. Yeah? And her introduction to political economy, which is the course she gave in the social democratic school, uh, half, almost half of the book, curiously enough, is about primitive communism. Yeah? She was fascinated by it. Yeah? And so she analyzed the existence of this primitive communism, not only in past, the past uh, life of, of Europe, etc but particularly it's persistent in the countries of what we today would call the global south, the colonized countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Yeah? The persistence of these forms of primitive communism, which is societies where private property, as we know it, didn't exist. There was a kind of common collective forms of property and the state didn't exist and uh, the patriarchal family didn't exist. Yeah? So this, uh, she was very much interested in this because this showed that these forms, private bourgeois, private property, the state, etc., are not eternal natural forms of human life yeah? for, because for thousands of years they didn't exist yeah? in human history. So, and if they didn't exist in the past, they can also cease to exist in the future yeah? because they are not part of human nature, so to say. Yeah? So it was important for her in terms of this historical perspective. Yeah? And so she saw a kind of affinity between primitive communism of the past and the modern communism of the future, which of course was different. Yeah? And she saw also a possible alliance between the modern communist movement of the working class in the industrial countries and the resistance of these primitive communist societies 
against colonialism and imperialism. Yeah? She had the hope that these two could converge against the common enemy. Yeah? And she discussed then how these different forms uh, developed and how they persisted throughout the centuries, and including in Latin America. Yeah? For instance, speaking about Peru, Ecuador, etc., Bolivia, she said, she mentioned something she called Inca communism. Inca communism. In the Inca empire, which existed till the colonial colonization of, of these countries by Spain, uh, of course, it was an authoritarian empire, but on the basis that uh, on the indigenous uh, peasant communities, there was a kind of primitive communism. Yeah? And she said this persisted till the 19th century. It's interesting to mention that the founder of Latin American Marxism, Jose Carlos Mariategui, which did not know Rosa Luxemburg's writings because they were in German, he didn't read German, but he also spoke of Inca communism in Peru and other countries in Latin America. And he said these collective traditions, collective traditions of the indigenous peasant community persisted till the 20th century. Yeah? He was writing in 1929. And the modern communist movement can base itself on this tradition, this communitarian collective tradition to develop the new revolutionary socialist movement in Latin America. Yeah? So, uh, so this is a few comments on uh, this issue, which is uh, indeed very interesting. Thanks, Michael. We have another question um, from the audience. Uh, if, you could, if you could expand um, on what Rosa Luxemburg's particular vision for socialism was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Rosa Luxemburg was, of course, a Marxist, and she, her view of socialism was the one developed in the writings of Marx and Engels. Huh? So she saw socialism as based on the collective appropriation of the means of production by the workers and by the people, huh? and the reorganization of production and consumption according to social needs in a process of democratic planning yeah, and the establishment of a revolutionary democratic power of the workers and for that that was the basic the basic tenets of, of socialism for her yeah. now but what characterizes let's say the specific contribution of Rosa Luxemburg, which is of course not contradictory with what Marx and Engels said, but it was one step forward, is her insistence on the importance of freedom and democracy in the process of building a socialist society. Yeah? There can be no transition to socialism, there can be no building of a socialist society without freedom and democracy, without the freedom of the workers and the people to organize in unions, associations, parties, etc., without the freedom of expression yeah, by publishing newspapers, books, pamphlets, etc., with different perspectives, different viewpoints, yeah, and without democracy. That means the democratic election of people, of representatives, etc., to uh, organize the political and economic uh, activities, etc. Et so she insisted very much on this, and this led to her well known polemic with the Bolsheviks in 1918 in her pamphlet, in her essay on the Russian Revolution, which was published, as you know, only after her death in 1921. Of course, she supported the Bolsheviks. Yeah? She said the Bolsheviks, they saved the honor of the socialist movement yeah? by opposing the war and by organizing a revolution. Yeah? 
So she said that the future belongs to both. Yeah? She, she supported them, but she supported them critically yeah? because she said, you are abolishing freedom. You are suppressing the democratic rights. You don't authorize opposition parties. You don't authorize a free press. You don't organize democratic elections. And inside the Soviets, the councils, you suppress pluralism. Yeah? The, the Soviets are, in fact, only a communist organization, com uh, organization of the Bolshevik Party. Yeah? So, of course, she sympathized she promoted, she supported the idea of a council democracy, yeah? a democracy based on workers and peasants council, yeah? on Soviets, not only in uh, Russia, but also in Germany, as well. but this council yeah? has to be democratic, has to be plural, yeah? has to permit different viewpoints because the building, the transition to socialism and the building of socialism requires discussion. It's a very complex problem and it, it cannot be solved without freedom of discussion, without diversity, pluralism, okay? and without democracy. That means people have to decide, not a political bureau, not leaders, even the most, the best leaders cannot decide instead of the people. The people itself, the workers and the people itself, have to decide what they want and how they want to build socialism. Yeah? So this was her understanding of what is socialism. And this is why she criticized her comrades, which she respected, of course, Lenin and Trotsky and the other Bolshevik leaders, although she, of course, was in solidarity with them, but she was critical of their authoritarian tendencies. And Shinzi said, there can be no socialism without freedom, liberty, and democracy. And I think this is something very, very important. And today, there are few revolutionaries who don't agree with her on this. Thanks a lot, Michael. We have, uh, we have now actually we have quite a few questions. I don't know if we're going to have time to get to all of them, but uh, one more that I uh, definitely wanted to include is um, you closed your presentation talking about the urgency of uh, the climate crisis and the need to address uh, global warming. And uh, one of the viewers in the chat asked if you could expand a bit on what you think uh, specifically, Rosa Luxemburg thought might have to contribute to understanding and addressing the climate crisis. Yeah. Well, uh, for Rosa Luxemburg, ecology and the ecologic crisis was not a big issue because at her time, it, the ecological crisis was just beginning to develop. Huh? The real catastrophic process of destruction of the environment became uh, decisive after the Second World. Yeah? This is why most scientists say the Anthropocene, when human activity started to disturb the whole geological uh, makeup of the planet, started uh, after the Second World War. Of course, its origins are after the Industrial Revolution, but it really became a dangerous process after the Second World War, and particularly in the last decades with neoliberalism. Yeah? So uh, it's normal that at Rosa Luxemburg's time, no Marxist, practically no Marxist, were uh, worried about the ecological problem of climate change. It was not, uh, it was not a real issue. Yeah? Now, what we find in Rosa Luxemburg is a strong feeling for nature, yeah? for the life of natural beings, being either plants, flowers, uh, or animals. Yeah? She felt a strong relation to life in general. Yeah? And she has very moving writings about life of birds, for example. Yeah? Birds were very important for her. 
and she has a writing on uh, the suffering of animals. Uh, she was very uh, affected by the fact seeing uh, some people uh, uh, torturing uh, uh, an animal, a horse, or a mule, I don't remember, yeah? from the prison. She saw this scene yeah? and she was really strongly identifying with this mule uh, who was being uh, strict, uh, striped and, uh, and tortured by, by somebody. Yeah? And also she writes very, she feels very strongly about the extermination of the buffaloes in the United States. Yeah? by the move of civilization to the uh, west coast yeah, the, the buffaloes were being exterminated and she felt very much uh, shocked by this yeah? so she, she had this kind of naturalist feeling which you can say is ecological in some sense yeah? she felt the community with life yeah? and I think this is something very important and this is a very strong characteristic of her personality yeah? of, as you can read particularly in her letters from prison you see very clearly this naturalist element this feeling for life this community with all forms of life now uh, as i said of course uh, climate change was not, not really an issue at, at, at her time so it's obvious that she couldn't uh, deal with it since it was really not uh, central. Now, what I think is the most important contribution of Rosa Luxemburg, next to this broad feeling for all forms of life, which I think, of course, is important, is internationally, yeah? because the ecological crisis, climate change, is an international issue, which you can fight only on international scale. Yeah? You cannot solve the ecological crisis in one single country. Yeah? You cannot have, uh, let's say, eco-socialism in one single country. Yeah? It doesn't work because the crisis is global, it's planetary. Yeah? So we need internationalism to deal with climate change and ecological crisis. So this is where Rosa Luxemburg, again, is very relevant yeah? because she argues all the time, we have to think in internationalist terms. Again, of course, it, she didn't think about the ecological issues, yeah, but she understood that the great issues of our time are international global issues, which have to be dealt in international terms. And this is an essential contribution of Rosa Luxemburg for the modern, for our, for the ecological movements of our times. And as I said, the most advanced uh, figures in the ecological movement understand this, yeah? like Greta Thunberg. Yeah? I don't know if Greta Thunberg ever read Rosa Luxemburg. Huh? Maybe, I don't know. But by her own understanding, she sees that this is an international issue. And she tried to organize this wonderful youth movement, a student movement, school uh, strike yeah? for against climate change in defense of climate justice, etc. So she, she, and not only she, there's millions of young people who mobilize, they have this internationalist understanding. Right? So this is very important. Before I ask one more question, I wanna say thanks to everyone uh, in the chat who is um, asking mm -hmm. questions. We're actually getting quite a lot of engagement um, and we're not gonna have time for, for everything, but there's one last question that I had wanted to ask you, and it has also been asked a couple times in the chat. Uh, maybe we can close this one because it's uh, kind of a tricky one. And that's namely, um, how do you think Rosa Luxemburg's understanding of internationalism could be applicable, uh, or how would you understand politics in the European Union through um, Rosa, Luxemburg's, Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg's lens? Because obviously, that kind of institution did not exist um, uh, when, when she was alive. And it's a, a peculiar institution in that it, on the one hand, expands the scope of politics beyond nation states and national sovereignty, but also arguably uh, limits democratic spaces to maneuver. So we had a question in the chat 
Would Rosa Luxemburg, uh, to put it more bluntly, would Rosa Luxemburg be for reforming the EU or uh, would she be for uh, scrapping it and starting over altogether? But perhaps also just more generally, how do you think an internationalist understanding um, informed by Rosa Luxemburg could analyze yeah. and conduct politics? Right. Well, Rosa, Lobo, Lo, Rosa Luxemburg sorry, said explicitly, an European federation will not solve the problem of imperialism and war. And we see this, yeah? uh, the existence of the European Union didn't stop the wars of happening, the intervention in uh, uh, Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, etc. you name it. Yeah? So uh, the European uh, Union, as she said, the European Federation uh, will not solve the problem. Yeah? That's one first thing. Now, uh, the European Union did not really overcome internationally, uh, nationalism, sorry. Nationalism persists in the European Union in two forms. One is each country in the European Union, and particularly some countries, are uh, all the time uh, defending uh, above all their own national, economic, or political interests. Huh? Uh, for instance, when the European Union tries to uh, propose a program of uh, decarbonization of the economy. Some countries, like Poland, uh, etc., say, no, we need carbon, we need coal, uh, we have our minds, we don't accept this, etc. So the, the national the nationalism continues to exist inside the European Union, eh? and there are many, many of them. And then, of course, you have some sort of European nationalism, that means the European Union as a kind of empire which has its own interest in confrontation to other countries, other empires, etc. Et yeah. Now, uh, to your question, would Rosa Luxemburg propose to reform the European Union or to scrap it? I think she would answer both. Huh? <laughs> she was a dialectical mind. Now, in, ref in her well-known book, Reform or Revolution, she said, we, the revolutionary market, we're not against reforms. Any reform which is positive, we support it. Raising wage, of course we are for it. Uh, universal suffrage, in Prussia, for instance, right? <laughs> in the EU, of course we fight for it. Yeah? Any reform which is favorable to the people, to the workers, we support it, we fight for it, of course. But we know that to solve the problems of society, to put an end to inequality, to put an end to wars, to colonial expedition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we need revolution. We need revolution. And revolution is not just, it's not an accumulation of reforms. Yeah? At a certain moment, you need the hammer of revolution to break. Yeah? the system yeah? and this is a, a revolutionary change yeah? so she would say about the european union yes reform any reform which is positive she would be for let's say in for instance giving to the european parliament much more power to the non-elected institution the european commission the so-called uh, economic uh, European, I don't know the name, uh, Commission, etc. Oh, this, the head of the European Bank, nobody elected him, eh? etc. All these institutions should be subordinated to the European Parliament, which was elected by the European people. Eh? So this is a reform she would support. Eh? Or uh, a minimum European, uh, an European minimum wage. Eh? To have a European minimum wage in all Europe, that she would support this. To have a common taxes, yeah? not uh, some European countries being a fiscal paradise, yeah, where all capitalists go put their money to get uh, avoid paying taxes. Yeah? So we have to unify the European tax system and have taxes. All countries have similar taxes on profits, capital, etc. So she would support all the reform, but she would say this is, doesn't solve the problem. Inequality will continue to exist. 
national conflicts will continue to exist, uh, exploitation will continue to exist, ethnic purges, wars, etc. We need revolution. So we need to replace this capitalist European Union by a democratic socialist European Union. We would say today a democratic eco-socialist European Union. Eh? But the idea is the same. We need revolution. We need revolution. But it doesn't prevent us from supporting and fighting for it. So that's the dialectical answer, which I think Rosa Luxemburg would give. Thanks so much again, Michael, both for your presentation as well as um, taking time to, to answer viewers' question. Uh, we're going to wrap up the first keynote presentation with that. Um, thanks again to everyone uh, who's watching on Facebook. And we'll be back in a little under one hour at uh, uh, 1 p.m. Central Europe. Reception on the Asian continent. See you then. <laughs>